Today is July the 28th, 2014. My name is Tanya Fincham, along with Juliana Nicolasian. We're with Oklahoma State University Library, and today we're in Jet, Oklahoma, to speak with Billy and Bonnie Stanley. And this is part of our Oklahoma Centennial Farm Families project, so thank you for having us today. Let's begin with having you t give us the history of the ownership of the farm, how the family initially came to have it, and then work our way forward to today. Go ahead. <laughs> well, the, the land actually was settled in the uh, land run in 1893 by her granddad, Trig Stanley, Trig Jet. We have a Trig Stanley in our family, so <laughs> make sure I get that right. And uh, then after that, uh, his son owned it, Wayne Jet. And when he passed away, and they settled his estate, her mother, Clara Jet Hopkins, bought it. And from that uh, ownership, then it was given to us, and we've lived here since 1955. So. So we've probably owned it longer, or been here longer than any of the rest of the owners. Do you, have any, do you have any idea why Trig chose this piece of property to begin with? The uh, Jet brothers, uh, there were five that made the run and another one that came and bought some property a little bit later that were old enough. Uh, the other Jet brothers weren't old enough make the land run. It had to be of a legal age. They weren't that old, so they couldn't make the run. They came later. And there was eight. No, there was more. It's Eleven. In that family. And they all settled in this area, and that's why the town is named Jet, is after that Jet family that made the land run. And Trigg settled on this place uh, New Jet settled on the place across the road. Uh, Dick Jet settled on the one south of that. Warner Jet settled across the road to the west. And then John Jet settled south of the highway. So they were all in a row across this area. And where they lived in Kansas, they had to haul water. And so they wanted a place where there was ample water. And uh, all of these places have some water on them, but Grandpa Jet's place actually just has runoff off of the other, so he didn't really have <laughs> a well or a good water supply. But they came from... But the others all did have good water. They came from Kentucky, Oldham County, Kentucky, that's where, and great-grandpa James Proctor fought in the Civil War he, in Prairieville at uh, Battle. And anyway, I think that was one reason they left there and they went to Boone County, Indiana. And then they heard about the run, that it was going to have a run, and then they came to Kansas. So that was kind of the... They moved to the Pilot Knob area around Harper, Kansas, Kansas. And then made the land run from there. What order was Trig in that, in that time? Was he the... He was... Dick was the oldest, and William was the oldest, and then Dick, and then uh, the tree was about the third. third. But they lost one that drowned in Kentucky, the older what? one. William. William. He drowned when he was a baby, or smaller age. And, uh, so, so how, how much acreage was the original piece? 160 acres. And what is it today? This place is 166 acres, acres. but he owned uh, other land around it. Later he bought land around it. And the six acres is off of the west place because he wanted water. So he bought six acres off of the neighbor to, that's the reason it's 166 acres. What did he grow on it initially? Oh, alfalfa. Corn. Corn. Oats. I don't think much weed. They, they had weed on some of the other places, places but on this not place, on they this place they it was more corn and alfalfa, alfalfa. and oats to feed for the horses. What were some of the first buildings he put up? 
Well, they had the dugout, dugout. first, mm -hmm. and then from then it was a barn, and it was a granary. And the granary, and then the house was built in 1901. And smokehouse, cellar. Uh, the old alcohol system was that where they had the. the the wash house, they had a dug well underneath the wash house, and uh, Grandma had to go down there to do her laundry. And uh, they had a Delco system in that building. They had electricity from that. The washer was in, was down underground? The t tubs and scrubbers, <laughs> scrub board, <laughs> because they didn't have a washing machine. And she had to carry the wet wet yeah. up, uh -huh. up the steps to hang them out. Hang them out on the line. Yeah. We've heard a little bit about a Delco, but we don't know that much about it. Do you? It was a battery it? system that had a called a wind charger that run a generator, and it would store electricity in the batteries. And then uh, it was a DC system instead of an AC system, and uh, which is direct current, alternating current. And uh, so everything was DC current and run off of the battery power. They use that just for the washer or for other things? Everything. everything. Their, what, what electricity power they had was DC battery power. Are any of those buildings still standing? Mm -hmm. The wash house for the Elko system is still standing, but not in the same location. We moved it out by the road and she had an antique shop in it. And, but it's still there, and uh, the uh, North Barn, where they their horses. The North Barn, they, they had their horses in the big barn that would hold a hundred ton of loose alfalfa hay. Burned. It was uh, caused from uh, internal combustion of the hay was too green when they put it in the barn, and then when the humidity and the atmosphere got right, it would combust internally, and that's what burnt the barn down. There was five barns burnt that day. And this was one of them on this place. And then uh, after that, uh, they, did, they never did build that barn, big barn back. And they built a horse barn and a granary. And then later the round top. And then uh, and just before World War II, built a uh, round top. I don't remember what year that was. No. 40, 39 or 40. It's a built a round top. The granary that is out here is getting a pretty bad repair, but it used to be uh, east, oh, probably two or three hundred feet, and it had a big flood, and it was full of wheat, and the water got up to the eaves on it. Go in and take picks and shovels and dig all the wheat out and spread it out on the ground and dry it, fed it to the hogs. I always think that, too, that Grandpa was a real strong man. I mean, he wasn't afraid of work. But in, and I'm not sure the year spans that this had all happened, but he, his barn burnt, um, the flood took his, the granary, and uh, he had a 16 year old daughter that died with tuberculosis. He lost his wife with cancer. Um, oh my, he had so many hardships, but he never gave up. He kept, he, it never, you know, he just kept right on a, and his youngest son was, he wasn't just really mentally re, retarded, I shouldn't say, I guess, but he was, he was not capable of doing his work. He, he was capable of, working, he wasn't capable of managing his business. His business mm -hmm. and his her mother was his guardian and she took care of him. But when grandpa lived here he uh, had a stroke and he well, we lived over about two miles from here and we took mother took him in because there wasn't any rest homes in, you know, like they are today. So she took him in and uh, took care of him and then Uncle Wayne lived here. Well, he was afraid to stay. So, for the house that I was born in, we call it up here on the Ball Hill. 
then they moved it over by the folks in, in Uncle Wayne. That was, he was close to mother where she could take care of him. So, you know, he had so many things that happened to him. And, uh, and I think that's what today makes me think, you know, we don't have it bad when I look at what he had. <laughs> so how many children did he have? Uh, eight. Eight. Four eight. boys and four, four girls. girls. And your mother was in what? what? She was next to the youngest. Next to the youngest. And she was born in 1911. When the property came into her, well, let's back up. Was she born in the, the house that was on the farm at that point? Was she born at home? The, yeah. Uh -huh. Yes, the, this house right here. In this house? Yeah. Yeah. So this is the 19th So you're, you're sitting in the old part of the house. We built on three sides of it. 1974, we added on, built on three sides, sides of it. The old house is still in here. So when you were a youngster, you... you came to visit this. Th yeah, this was Grandpa Jess, yeah. Uh -huh. And Mother always cooked for ha a harvest when they start putting up uh, threshing hay and things in baling, and she would cook for the harvest, and then she'd go down and work in the field and uh, either uh, run the buck rake or sit at the stationary baler, and she'd poke the wires in and, you know, and do all that. Yeah. But anyway, this, this was the the history of the Jets right here. <laughs> Four rooms and then the kitchen here was a, they used it as a kind of to put their wooden and then store their wood for the winter, but then they had to make a bedroom in for all the family. So this was really a five room home with eight kids. So. When they lived here, it was only a three room home. Yes, yeah. And then the porch was added on. Oh. And did it have running water? No. No. A an outhouse, outbuilding? Yeah. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. A yeah. one-seater or a two or more than that with eight kids? You know, I'm not sure. The first one I remember was a one, one seater, yeah. but it was, when we moved here, it was just a one-seater. One -seater. Uh -huh. And there wasn't any water then either. They had a sister, but no running water. When we were married, this is, has always been our home. And uh, there wasn't any running water, no bath or nothing. And uh, uh, we no, we weren't married very long, and then we put in the running water. We run the water from that well that up here to a there's a Woolworth house behind the house, and we put electric pump in there, and then run it into the house from that well down there. And that was our water supply. And then we put in the bathroom. Well, uh, neighbor where her folks lived was going to move to town and so they sold everything out of their house and so we bought their water pump and uh, bought water heater and the tub <laughs> the tub with feet on it yeah. and they gave us the pipe that if we wanted to dig it up so I went over and dug up all the pipe and we bought the other stuff from them and we brought it over here and then that's where I got the pipe. So did plumbing and everything. We went down to their house and dug up all the, they had their uh, pump was about as far from the house as this one was so there, there was pipe all the way and so we had that pipe to bring it from the well down there up here. And that, that was the first of any running water or liquid. Well, Grandpa had electricity, but no bathroom for running water. It was a good day, wasn't it? Then, when that, when it that was a yeah. good day. It was. <laughs> Do you remember about when electricity came to the farm? 1938 was the first uh, electricity from Alpha Alpha Electric, which was an REA company where I lived. Uh, we didn't have electricity until '41. We were we were past the end of the line that they had designed and we had to wait until there were others that lived there before that wouldn't extend it for one family but they would for two and uh, none of the other families wanted electricity so we didn't have any until 41 when it came out with an expansion program and added more lines. Which we take for granted today. Uh -huh. 
So when when your grandfather gave up the farm, gave up farming, well, let's back up. Before, did he have people that helped him when he was doing the actual farm work himself? Well, he had his boys. He, yeah, and then two of them went to war to World War One. There was three sons, four sons. Four sons. And they all helped with the farm at one time or another until World War One. And two of the boys, Everett and Leonard, were drafted. And they left Cherokee on a troop train and came back through this place on the troop train. And then they went to uh, Texas to their basic training and went to France during the war and came back. And they were both on the same troop. They stayed together all the time they were in the service. They were in the same outfit. And they, uh, when they came back, they came back through this place on the troop train going back to Cherokee, which was the county seat. And one of them didn't want to have to walk home, so he jumped off of the train when it went through, <laughs> rolled down the grade and got all scammed up. And the other rode in, and Grandpa was waiting in town for him. And it was a team and wagon. I thought it was always real, you know, everybody kind of always got a big joke out of that, you know. But anyway, and then when they came back, then Uncle Leonard, he went, he uh, he didn't want to be part of the farming. And Uncle Virgil was, um, he was there, but he, he was just kind of a problem child. But anyway, he, Grandpa would set him up and, you know, got him a tractor when they came out and everything. But he'd go behind the railroad and shut the tractor off and walk the town, and he never, you know, he couldn't depend on it. And finally, he went to Oregon and worked in a alfalfa mill, and he was shot in a gambling deal. And that was another one that Grandpa lost his son to. But anyway, they, uh, they shipped his body back, and my aunt uh, that lived, had lived in Watonga, she, he shipped it to her, and when she got the package, she said it was just full of alfalfa leaves. And he had one daughter, and in about, what, the 70s, I think, uh, she came back from Escondido, and they had been up to Oregon. She wanted to find out what really happened to her dad. And all the pages in the courthouse was ripped out, and they had no record of it. So really, you know, we don't really know what really happened, no, he was shot. Boys thought the sheriff was in on it because yeah. the pages were torn out of it. He, he had a, they said he had a lot of money, you know, he had won in gambling. And they figured that probably somebody just relieved him of it. But anyway, uh, and, and you know, I remember when they brought him back, and, and of course there was two south windows there, and, and they put him on the, in a casket on uh, the library table. And I can remember somebody lifting me up and looking in there, because I, I have that memory, I know, because I was probably about four years old. <laughs> and, uh, but anyway, that's kind of the history of, of uh, that part. And, uh, well, did your grandfather work work off the farm? No. No, so he made his living yeah. on the farm? Yeah, the farm. and when he got where, you know, uh, we, there was, I had two other sisters, and we was just, behind him continually. We was with him. But he never went anywhere unless he had a shovel. And he would uh, take sandbars. He would, you know, just walk and walk and walk. Well, we'd get tired of, you know, but he never quit taking care of the sandbars. He, but he always was busy doing something. And, uh, but, uh, After he kind of, uh, the farming and the uh, in laws and the kids took over. Uh, he did the cooking. So when they were in the field with uh, putting up hay or bundles or thrashing or whatever, he, he cooked for them. And they all come in. They always talked about how good his biscuits were because he made biscuits almost every day. Uh -huh. Had a big wood range, right? Well, there was two windows, one there and one there, and the range was between them. In a fireplace, in a chimney, and uh, he—that's where he made the biscuits and all that. Wood stove. And I, I can remember he would uh, 
be rolling out biscuits, and I mean, they were big pans because they had a lot. To, and anyway, you'd have a white apron on, and he'd do like that, and he'd reach down and get some wood and stoke it in the in the stove, and wipe his hands off and go right back <laughs> needing the dough for the biscuits. <laughs> well, it worked. It you worked. Know. Uh -huh. and, uh, but uh, he could he could put up some pretty good. Uh, Biscuits, I know that. And fried chicken. He had a lot of fried chicken. He, he himself actually fried the chicken? Oh, yeah. Yeah, he done all of it, yeah. Yeah, but he couldn't work in the field anymore. He, he took over the cooking. Of course, he lost his wife, so yeah. he took care of Uncle Wayne and he did all the cooking for that. He just, uh, you know, and, and you know, you just think back of all the what people went through. We don't have a clue. Of how yeah, I don't. I don't think people understand what the early day settlers went through to settle this country. I mean, they everything was the hard way. There was no easy way to do anything, and so they they had to go through the you know bad weather. It was wasn't. After they made the land run in 1893, then that winter was really cold down to zero. And they didn't, of course, the dugout was pretty warm, but as far as other clothes, they didn't have. Yeah. You know, the kind of windbreaker clothes with insulation and everything like we have now. So. Now, Grandpa was married before he made the run, and he had a Uncle Leonard, was the oldest. And Grandma was expecting with. Uncle Everett. But anyway, uh, she, the mother would tell that grandma, of course, the dugout, she was living in the dugout, and, and she was uh, standing at the door of the dugout, and an Indian was riding a horse and came across, and she said it, she was scared for her life because she didn't, you know, know really what to expect, and she said he stood there and watched her for a while and went on southwest on the horse. And, uh, now uh, this place is in right on what was called the Cantonment Trail. It went from Park City to Canton, and Canton was the last uh, uh, Indian outpost where they would go and get supplies, and they were delivered from Park City to Canton. And so this is right on the trail of that. Went by the Barrel Springs across the road here, and then down to Timberlake Springs, and all all those trails were developed where they could find water to take care of the horses and people to get water. So, so the farm was on that, and then it was obviously close to a railroad then. Too. Well, the railroad came in in 1905, and the town of Jet was at that time was uh, two miles east of where it is now. And they had a choice of either moving the town to the railroad, or the railroad would start a town. But the Bell Springs was, was the there. road where the town was was uh, called uh, Albert Pike Highway, which was not a highway; it was just a trail from Hot Springs, Arkansas, to uh, Colorado Springs, Colorado, and uh, they. Uh, they crossed the railroad and, and uh, Albert Pike Highway crossed where the town of Jet is, and that's where they set up the town site. And then uh, before it was ever paved, and it was later gravel and some bridges put in, but uh, that's where the town was originally, it was two miles east of where it is now. But the first was right across the road at Barrel Springs. Yeah, the, that was just a uh, uh, a gathering place. Yeah, gathering place. And the jet boys would take their supplies over to Palm Creek. That's where they, and, and they, they would tell some pretty hairy stories you know, on the going to, to Palm Creek. And they usually stayed all night. Then they'd bring supplies back for the neighbors. Then they'd come over here and pick up their supplies and mail. So. 21 miles to Palm Creek just straight through. Of course, they had to wind around the creeks and everything. Why did it take longer? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so they go over one day and stay all night, and then they bring supplies back the next day when they took their produce over there to sell them. 
because that was the only railroad that was in Pond Creek. Does the railroad still come through yet today? No. No, they took it out. They took it out. Uh, yeah. I don't remember what year. I don't either. I just hate, I love the railroad. It just, you know, it. you could hear the train. I mean, you knew about when they were going, going and coming. And in the winter, the ground would be frozen. You're, you could just feel the vibration of the ground uh, being frozen, the train come through. But the Jets, the reason they call this Jets is they say, uh, the neighbors say, well, let's go over to Jets and get our supplies. And that's how, it started, and then they moved down two miles uh, east of Jet, and uh, but that's kind of the way. Because each one of the brothers had mercantile and the Jet Visitor, and uh, there was two of them was veterinarians, uh, and one had the um, what was the post office? The post uh, he wasn't really the first postmaster. Mr. Corbett was, but he became the postmaster of Jet. And, uh, so. Was there a point in time well, when Trigg thought he might lose the farm? No. Was it ever in danger? No, I don't think he, he never mortgaged this much. He bought some other land that was mortgaged, but he never he never would mortgage this place when he bought other land. Did he keep records of his business, what was what was coming and going, and oh yeah, that he, type of thing. yeah, he did. In fact, we've got some a lot of his that we have captured because nobody else wanted it. <laughs> we we just don't let anything get by, you know. But we have, uh, in fact, uh, when the bank failed up here, a lot of the old ledgers they gave to the uh, museum over Turkey. A lot of the guys' records through their banking and everything was in those ledgers. So, Bill and I went over there one time and went through. He bought uh, quite a bit of land. In, in uh, the late 30s, early 40s, I'm not sure exactly what time. Uh, about all of the Jet brothers went to New Mexico and bought land out there. He was going to get in the ranching business. They didn't realize how dry it was in New Mexico until <laughs> they bought some land up right. there and finally they sold all of it. But, back? Yeah, well, he, they never did move. Well, two of the Jet yeah. brothers did move out there, but the others never did move. They just owned land. Yeah, there. Joe did. He lived out there. He never did come back. But John and Henry and, uh, and then uh, the youngest boy, Sam, now he had a confectionery. He had that, and he just, uh, uh, you know, that was his. Uh, made ice his, uh, cream. Made ice cream, yeah. yeah. And, uh, Sold cigars and cold drinks. Cold drinks. And we always wonder how did they make ice cream? No ice. But evidently, I don't know. But evidently, it was a process. That yeah, they did. And candy. I don't know. He just, in fact, we've got a lot of his. Uh, Little pewter uh, ice cream dishes, little spoons. And he did that in Jet? Yeah. Well, he did it in the old town. Old town and then when and it moved, moved, he did it again. Town. Moved over there and did it again over there. And then Grandpa Jet had the Jet Mercantile where they sold the dry goods. And then not only that, he, he farmed. And he built the Mennonite Church in Jet. It's now they, they now, were, but it's the they Mennonite. were Mennonites when they came okay. to this area. But then, as the younger ones married, uh, they split off, and were and of course, the Mennonite church folded up later. But he pretty much built it and maintained it, and kept it going. But two of the sisters, when they made the run after they got caught in sale, they came down and they cooked for the their brothers, Alice and. And Anna married Finch, which was a, he run the Jet Visitor. And then Anna, I mean, and Allison, I don't know what he, he did. Do you remember? That's one of Mary Rufus. Uh huh. He was a deputy. Okay. Yes, Marshal. And 
um, he settled on a place south of town and they married and raised their family down there, but he, then he got electrocuted. And then changing a light bulb in the basement and something shorted out. And, and John was the sheriff in Grant County for years. And in fact, I, I know I, you know, you always kind of feel like you're selfish because I always want to, I don't want any of the, the things get away from family. But uh, my cousin in Arizona got his badge. And I thought, oh, that would have been so neat to have. But I'm sure that will never happen. But I always thought that was so neat. And he's a veterinarian too, so you know that really not only just one trait, but they they get a lot of other you know things to thrashing crew and. No, there was a big livery barn in the old town of Jet. That's where the two Jet brothers that were veterinarians. That's where they operated out of that barn and uh, took care of. Them. They were actually horse doctors more than they were veterinarians because it. And I've got all the tools that they had to do work on horses' teeth. They were, they were horse dentists, and if you didn't take care of a horse's teeth, you would starve to death because their teeth would get long and they wouldn't line up and they didn't fit and they couldn't eat. And so they'd starve to death. And so they had the equipment to, if they had to pull a tooth or if they had to file a tooth down so it'd be the same height as the other, or whatever it took to make their mouth sound so they could eat. How had they learned to do that? Had they gone to a, a official training somewhere? I, I don't yeah. think there was any <laughs> place that they went to school to learn. I think to it learn. was just trial and error. Being practical. Yeah. 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 But they had a lot of chemicals that they probably didn't have any business with because they, they couldn't have really known what the chemicals would do if they mixed them or mixed them with something that they didn't know anything about. But they, had, they were, there's a whole deal of vials of all the different... And big old clamps that they'd go in and pull their teeth if they had to. I couldn't even hardly lift them. But anyway, uh, Uncle Dick lived uptown, and my aunt and uncle lived right across the alley. And when he only had one boy, and when he that boy didn't amount to much, and and Uncle Dick, when he died, um, the boy left, and his wife then soon died, and um, it was just left in the house. And my uncle went across there, and, and he found them, so he took them, and well, he wanted to know if we wanted them. I said, yeah. We even took them down to Ena to the museum, thinking that maybe, you know, it'd be nice to display them for people, and uh, they weren't interested. So, we got them. <laughs> they said they would come sometime and look at them, and that they would probably take them and put them in storage, and then later we would put them on display. So, we never did send them down there. They never would show up either. <laughs> well, during the years of the Depression, how did the farm survive? It was tough. He had uh, times when the machinery that he owned, they would want to come and repossess it. And he just kept telling them, no, you're not going to get it. And he came through. Yeah, you know, and he did something come through that he hit a, maybe a good crop, or a fairly good, you know, that kind of, gave him enough where he could hang on to to everything. But he bought uh, he bought one, two, three, four, five, five or six quarters that he had yeah, bought in ten at one time. And yeah, ten and then not putting them. And so, you know, but he never mortgaged this one. Intended to lose, to lose his home, but uh, and today I think we are the only heir that still has the land that was you know that was in the jet that was the, the original yeah, mm -hmm. and we farm and we bought a half section that was his, and uh, so we've always tried to you know you can't do it all I understand that but we've always tried to. 
you know, keep everything we possibly could that was, in, you know, that was his and in the Jeff family. So it came to be in your mother's hands about when? 1970 or 71, something like that. Late 1969, so it would have been around 70. And, and you were born when? 37. So you would have known him quite a bit. Yeah. For quite a while. Yeah, Uncle, you mean Uncle Wayne or? Your, your grandfather. Oh, yeah, my grandpa. Oh, yeah. And you know, we he just. He lived with them. He, he lived with yeah, us. He had his stroke. stroke and, and he, in fact, he he was, he was, you know, he would buy us school clothes, and he'd take us down, and and he'd uh, buy us overhauls and a red bandana, handkerchief, and oh, we was just thinking we were just about the neatest kids in the on the street, and but he was always so good to us, and then he raised a big garden, potatoes, and and mother would can, and grandpa, well, grandpa would always help her, but. They, you know, put up as much food as they possibly could because he had that garden. And uh, but no, he he. And then when he got uh, moved over with us for permanent, uh, he told us he said, "If you two girls will take piano lessons, I'll pay for it." Well, you know that was a a big deal because it was like not much a lesson, but anyway. Uh, we took piano lessons and he paid for it. And I think I took for eight years and and my sister took seven. You had a piano at home? or It was Aunt Edna's, that was his daughter that died. The daughter that died, he had bought her an upright grand, grand. piano. And, and she, uh, she that's had what they to play on. And my daughter's got it now. When this had the sale, why well, she, uh, she bought it. And she's got it beautiful. I mean, it's got ornate on it. It's just a beautiful piano, but uh, that's all. Uh, so from 1893 until 1970s, he he had it. He, he owned it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then once your mother got it, what did she do with it? She kept it and then and then deeded it to Billy and I. Did you raise crops on it and work it too? Mm -hmm. Did you? Yeah. Well, in fact, uh, my dad he farmed it and uh, he did, and then when he died. Gave it up, and, you know. We got it, and uh, they gave, you know, not. I guess they say gave it to us. They did it to us. So it's, uh, and you know, even today, with some of the years that our crops has not been good, it's been tough, you know. Because of course, the banks that's the first thing they want is land, <laughs> you know. But we fought for it. And, so. Well, the the banks have changed over the years. They don't. They don't operate like they used to. They don't care a number. They don't care whether you live or die or what, as long as they get their money. What well, what we did in the Centennial in 1993, about two years before that, we decided we think we'd like to have a run out here and have all the jets that we could possibly find, send them letters, and we'd have a three-day celebration. Well, we did, and we had uh, got a big tent, and the little shop out there was our land office where they register when they'd come in, and then there was the five Jet Brothers. We had white flags that we had that we'd, if we'd want to have each one of the families have one person to run to stake the claim. We had old cars, we had surreys, uh, we had church service, we had a watermelon feed, we had a horse pit, a horseshoe pigeon. We had what else did we have? I washer wagon. Yeah. But it, all the games that they used to play right. in the early days that we could find out about. That we, we and then had we, some of those. We had a, a dance, barn dance. I mean, everything we thought they did then, because the Jet Brothers played at dances. They were with their instruments. They went around and. Play to dances, so we tried to make it as as much like it as we could. We had uh, how many did we have? Well, three hundred registered during the three day period. Mm -hmm. Not all of them stayed for all three days, but they would come for one day or two days, and then 
that 64, 65 first cousins. That one of them was, uh, his job took him to Australia and uh, he told him he wouldn't uh, go unless they would let him come back for the Jeopardy. Jeopardy. And, and they agreed to let him come back, so he came back. So we had some from Canada and one from Australia besides. About 34 states, states. were represented. Yeah. And we had church service on Sunday morning, and uh, we had one family that took you out a choir. The Green family yeah. were descendants of the one of the Jets. So they took them for the church service. And then we end, ended up the day with a ha big hamburger fry. But on Saturday night we had a, I, I can't remember what we had, but uh, I, we just, we had the most wonderful time. And they, you know, of course a lot of them are gone now. And, uh, but that was uh, something that we really felt like that it was worthwhile. I told him, I said, well, there's two times that the Cherokee outlet or the land run will be important. And that was the day they had it and the 100th anniversary. The 200th anniversary, there won't be enough people around that even heard about it to even care. So well, you're 20 years into that, though. So yeah, so we tried to, yeah. you know, make that a big weekend so everybody could come with mm -hmm. And that's why one reason why it was three days is so people that couldn't come on one day could come on another. So the two of you took over farming it in the 80s? Uh, 76. 76. 76. Mm -hmm. That's when your dad retired. Retired, yeah. 76. Uh -huh. And has it been your main source of income or have you had secondary jobs? Or oh, no. Would it be primary? Yeah, farming is. Well, in. We've had. Uh, we had the boys did custom harvesting along with the farming. And, and then we. One time we had three combines that run all the way from Texas to Canada. They didn't go into Canada, but they. Went up I guess they did one year. Yeah, one year they did. The rest yeah. of the time they just went up to Montana or North Dakota. Mm -hmm. Then they'd come back. And, 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 and then they decided they'd go back south and start on the corn harvest, and that didn't. That wasn't very good. No. That's a hard, bad time of the year to try to make that. And we corn always, we had a registered Angus herd, and we had production sales. Mm -hmm. and so not just wheat then. No. no. Uh -uh. Yeah. Where would you take your wheat to, to market? To the local elevator. To, to elevator. In jet. In yeah, jet. In jet. We did uh, for a while. We took some to the Gulf at. Uh, or not to the Gulf, but the port, port over Tulsa, Catoosa. When, we, when they were doing the custom harvesting, we had two semis, and so in the wintertime when we had time, well, we'd haul wheat, and then we started hauling wheat for other elevators around. So that was another source of supplementing the income. Well, we noticed the shelter belts coming in. Uh -huh. Is there a story about those? Do you there there were a lot of shelter belts planted. We planted some uh, over the years. But people that's bought the land where we planted them, they tore them all out. So. And we're going to, probably not another dust bowl, but we're going to pay for taking them out. Because they, they, uh, they were a big asset at one time. But be able to keep the ground from blowing up. Well, these seem like they do the job currently. Yeah. yeah. Were there other con cons conservation efforts done on the farm over the years? Terraces. Terraces and waterways. So. And who did those do? Uh, which, which generation, I guess, which did yeah. those? It was uh, Uncle Leonard's. Yeah, so it'd be your grandpa's sons, sons when they were farming they, they started they it. Started doing the terracing and then we've been doing it ever since, adding more terraces. I think we've got over two hundred acres of terraces. Two hundred miles. Two hundred miles I mean. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. So but it does you have to have an inferior yeah. Help protect.
take the land. And then the terraces, according to some, and I kind of think they're right, is that has caused more alkali because the water's held up on the side of the hill, slow it down so it doesn't run off as fast, and then it soaks into the soil and percolates down through the soil until it comes to the shale layer and then it can't go any farther down so then it works its way down along the shale to the bottom land and then it like water is uh, goes to the point of least resistance and then that's to go back up when it comes to gets underneath the bottom land and that's where all the alkali shows up to the bottom, mm -hmm. on the best land. Uh, when Uncle Leonard or Aunt Dosha had it, they put in the, that, uh, where the water drains, I can't remember what it was. Oh, the tile. The tile. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it, it's under the alkali ground and drains drain. to the creek. And you know, it's just as... And it helps. It helps, yeah. And on that one, it runs all the time. And it has helped the alkali because it's kind of going away. Yeah, so. And when the water percolates down through the soil and gets down, then that tile will pick it up and drain it out. Drain it out. And then, so it doesn't come back up. But he did that to his place, so, which helped. Do you have met much interaction with county agents through the years? Over the years, we have. Uh, we were worked with them in the 4-H and, and in our the soil conservation and all the practices that, well, there's a lot of practices you have to be involved in in order when they had government payments for farmland. Mm -hmm. uh, you didn't qualify for any government payments if you didn't follow those conservation practices. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we would, our kids was real active 4-H and FFA and and uh, through the 4-H, we had an exchange student from the Netherlands that stayed with us through the 4-H Foundation. And uh, we went over there to see him. And uh, I, I haven't heard from him for quite a while. In fact, I think the, the saddest thing was when we got home from over there, he just was royal to us. We just had the nicest time with him. Of course, we didn't set up with him all the time because we traveled with a train and went through other parts of the country over there. But um, him and his wife got a divorce. And you would have never known it when we were over there. We were just so sad. And then it wasn't uh, probably two years he came back and he brought his you know, friend with him. And that was disappointing. So and that, that's beside the point. But anyway, we did that through the 4-H Foundation, National Foundation, done that, so. And we were involved with the local 4-H, the county 4-H, the state, national, international. Got a roundup at OSU. Yeah. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. Were you a member of Homemaker Club? Uh-huh. What was the name, or is it, and is it still going? Yeah, it's still going, but it's changed its name. It was Jet Industrious Club is what it was when I was there. But now I don't even, oh, it's so O-C-H-E or something like that. I'm not sure. That's, That's an issue, yeah, O-C-H-E. Yeah. Uh -huh. And, uh, but I, uh, it was the Jet Industrious when I was in it. But I think when the, oh, I got out when the kids got older and, you know, and I, Bill and I was the one to have to do all the farming because the boys were in school and, and I had to drop out because I didn't have time for it. But I did, I, I enjoyed it, I really did. I always compete things in the fair. and I canned a lot. So what was your specialty? <laughs> what was it? <laughs> Canning. Yeah. Jellies or tomatoes or what? Well, yeah, uh, I had done um, peaches and uh, jelly, and uh, I think I did uh, tomatoes. tomatoes yeah. Ketchup, you Ket made a lot of ketchup. Ketchup, yeah, entered that. Do you, do you do much of that today? Not today, I don't, no, I don't. Do you have a garden? No. 
Not even a tomato plant. No. Well, I've got two out here in the in pods, but they don't look very good. <laughs> They're not going to make any. <laughs> They're not going to make any ketchup. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I did, but I just, I, I just, I'm really not very able to, to really, and, and we don't hire any help. We just, he does the farming and I help him and, you know, that's pretty much. We used to have a, about two acres of garden. Uh -huh. All the time. But the boys in the 80s, early 80s, when they came out with this PIC program, the government program, um, it, it, it really devastated the farming of everybody. And uh, about uh, oh, 84, 85, uh, we told the boys is there isn't enough, enough for all of us to, to live off of because they had just taken about everything the farmer could master up to survive. And then the bank failed up here. And then our bank failed up here and we had all our banking up here and uh, it just was a roller coaster for a while and we just told them to we'll take the debt you go out on you know and get you a job and uh, and they did the one boy took the semi and he all cattle and done that and then it got word your permits and insurance and going to one state after another state it just took everything they had to whatever you made it took to pay that so he just said you know so we sold the semi and you know when they had the three combines it got to where it took eight thousand dollars per combine and truck to buy the permits and insurance, insurance. before they ever left here just, it just, and it, as the combines got bigger, the trucks got bigger, and the permits got higher. And you had to do the trailers, get bigger trailers. And it just got yeah. to the point where you had to make that much money just to pay your startup costs. And if you didn't have a good year, you couldn't do it. So. And then our other boy, he uh, he went and worked on a ranch up there north of the river for a while, and they sold it. So now he's working for a construction order at Nash Building Oil Field sites. Got a good job. So how many children do you have? Two boys and a girl. Two boys. Our girl's in the middle. She's a postmaster at Helena Post Office. She lives mm -hmm. in Jeff as she drives down there. The youngest boy, he uh, he uh, he helps us with farm, but he's uh, was a pumper for Sandridge Oil Company. And then, uh, but anyway, they live around when we get to see them. Not a lot, but they we know they're there. <laughs> and, uh, did, did uh, through the years, has the farm maintained the mineral rights for the property? Oh, you know, but this one, one down one here, we... One place we bought, didn't have we didn't get the minerals with them. So. But we had the breast up, but we did. Has that helped? Yeah, oh, it's made yeah. a lot of difference. Yeah. Yeah. We, we, I tell you what, it, it, it was a godsend to a lot of people in this area, because it, you know, it, but, one day out of the clear, we thought, you know, we was trying to figure out what we going to do. <laughs> and a guy drove in from Chesapeake and said it's going to uh, put a well down here on this one place. And it was a good well. And that really helped. And then we sold a lot of leases for pipelines and that has just been tremendous. It's a headache to keep up with all of that. Uh -huh. Kind of fun. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of different. Different. Yeah. Oh, when did this start then? In the eighties or nineties or no, just this recently? Year, just this was about four years ago. Four years ago. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Recently. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That my granddad on my mother's side was worked on a seismograph crew, and he had he was secretary of a little oil company in the early days of the jet. And he said, he always said, there's oil and gas under all of this land through here. But they never did drill, and if they drilled, it was a dry hole. But now they're doing that horizontal drilling, and that really has been the lifesaver. <clears throat> but uh, this one place, uh, when we bought it from this lady, uh, she didn't want to sell the mineral lights. And then about a year later, had a guy from Oklahoma City call and wanted to know if we'd buy, want to buy some of the minerals. And that's the first we ever heard that she sold them. So I called her and I said, why didn't you let us know we bought the place? And she said, well, I needed the money real quick. 
And she said, I just took that up with... Sold it to somebody and could give her the cash. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we lost out. But the other we had, you know, the others we've got the minerals. And, uh, but, it, you know, it's, it's just... And we've been offered a lot of money for the minerals. But once it's gone, it's, it's gone. gone. We won't and never you, get them back. You won't buy it back for what you sold it for. Mm -hmm. Then her grandpa owned two quarters of land. That's where the lake is now. And if they ever drill under that, he still owns the minerals. When when the government took the land for the lake, uh, they didn't get the minerals. They let the landowner keep, keep the, minerals. the minerals. So he's out there covered with water. <laughs> but it's close enough. To the, the shore, yeah, that they, they could drill in that uh, section. Yeah, underneath it, yeah. Well, but, we, we noticed some wind turbines, turbines yeah, coming up. Yes. That, has that been? It's not close enough. We don't, we're not involved in okay. it. And well, that's around Hunter and uh, Pond Creek, Pond Creek, Kremlin. over in that area. Uh -huh. And all of that electricity that's generated from that wind farm goes to Georgia, Georgia. Wow. state of Georgia. Interesting. Uh -huh. Yeah. Now, Alfalfa County can't get the wind chimes. Well, the story is that Alfalfa County doesn't have enough wind. Wind. Now, can you believe but that? I think most of it's because of the air base. Air base. We, you know, we're in flight. Yeah. It's in the flight yeah, pattern. Be. Our son was, uh, youngest son, when he, uh, on the farm, and uh, he went to Vance and was a farmer down there for, Oh, probably 10 years, and then he came up here they, at Kegelman's part of Vance training, and he was far, well, then they decided when they start cutting back that they wanted them to drive, and he lived at Jeb, but they wanted him to drive to Enon, get on a van, drive back up here on the base, work till 6 o'clock, go back to Enon. Get his car and drive home. And get his car and drive home. And he said, I don't think so. I can find something, well then he got on the, doing the, that's when the oil deal began to really pick up and he got, so. But I think the the biggest thing that they was trying to do was get rid of the union. Union, yeah. That had all the personnel and vans were all civilians and firemen and maintenance and all that were civilians, but it was a union and they wanted to get rid of that. So they come up with this better idea. You can drive to Enid and ride the band back. <laughs> <laughs> I just, it didn't make sense. None at all. And uh, But he just, uh, he said, no. He said, I don't have no time. You know, he said, I leave at 5 o'clock to drive to Enid. Then when I get back, 7, a little after 7, and I have to drive home. He said, I don't have any time for my wife or he had a boy. And he said, you know, I said, I'm not. I don't think so, but uh, he he's been doing this and helping us when when he can, which I don't know what we'd do without him, really. Well, what's the biggest challenge today to keeping the farm going? Competing with the big farmers uh -huh. for prices or for what? Uh, the big farmers just buying up all the land. All the land. Or leasing it. They, they'll just pay whatever it takes to get it. They don't. I don't even know how it works. They they gotta be doing something. I don't know anything about for the, the price of equipment. You know, yeah. three hundred fifty thousand dollars for a tractor and a planter, and that five hundred thousand for a new combine, and that kind of. I don't know how how they. They gotta be. They have they other gotta farm sources. All of the county and half of another one to to make that work. I think that's that's the real challenge. But you know, bigger's not better. <laughs> but the, well, that's not what settled this country. No. That's, that's not what developed this country, was big operations. It was the little operations collectively that built the elevators and built the towns and did all that. But you know, when I had my little shop out here, um, what really, and I did, I did good. I really did. But what, what really hurt is when Walmart began to come in, mm -hmm. and they run the mom and pop stores out, 
and then his aunt lived, uh, bought my uncle, uh, my uncle and aunt's property in Jed when she came back from California, and she left it to us. Well, when that happened, I moved on. I moved in town and put my antique and gift shop in town. And that was it. It just that it was the same thing. Those big stores just run the mom and pops out. Mm -hmm. You can't compete against it. The only way that she could make it work is she'd go to market either in Denver or Dallas or somewhere and get new items that Walmart hadn't started selling yet. And then she could sell those. Yeah. But be, as soon as Walmart got them. Got them, then you, you know. And you know, you'd have people come in and they'd say, uh, you could hear them so say, well, you can get this at Walmart for so and so. And you wanted to say, then just get at it. <laughs> go for Happy it. Butt down there just go it for it, lady. <laughs> <laughs> I don't care. <laughs> but don't be telling that in the store. <laughs> but I had a lot of people, tourists. No, I didn't have no many local people. They just will not, and pray tell me, I have no idea why they don't support the local people, the merchants. It, it's that way everywhere, though. Yeah, oh you, yeah. You talk to business people in other towns, and they'll say, well, we do pretty good, except the locals don't trade uh -huh. with us. But and my, I don't know what it is. I don't know, but I'd have, you know, people, and it was on the highway going to the lake, and, you know, and I had people stop, and uh, I'd have, I mean, I'd, I sold a lot of things just driving through in tourist. And uh, but then when that when and then the real kicker was in nine eleven when that happened, people quit buying. I mean absolutely well, they, quit they, they quit traveling everything. I sold candles and porcelain dolls and mixed them up with my antiques and you know, and a lady from Palm Creek come and bought a lot of that and then the furniture uh, we had just at an auction and, and sold it. And, uh, but you had unique items. You had maple uh, syrup from Vermont. Uh, and, mm -hmm. You know, places like that. Like that, that, that was different. They right? couldn't get just anywhere, so. But anyway, to this day, I've never been in a Walmart. I don't tend to go. That just left a bitter taste in my mouth. <laughs> well, when you look at 10 of the richest women in the world, five of them are the Walton family. You kind of think that something's going on there that shouldn't be. Yeah, so. And I know I've talked to people that sell products to Walmart, and once you start selling to Walmart, you can't sell to anybody else. Mm -hmm. That's in the contract. Right. So they, they control everything that they are involved in. Where's the closest one in Enid? Uh, Enid, Enid or Alba. Alba. No. We're kind of in between. Yeah. And the, when you talk about the lake, you're talking about Canton, Canton no, Lake? Salt no, lake. Salt, salt, great salt, salt Lake. Salt Lake. Great Salt Lake. Mm -hmm. we're, we're close to that. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. You are. That's three or four miles. <laughs> yeah, if you go down here at the corner and go straight north, you'll go by the air basin and the dam. And the lake across right the bridge and all that camping and everything. Is there? Mm -hmm. How did you two meet? <laughs> I can't remember when I didn't know her. <laughs> <laughs> we just lived two miles apart, and uh, he was two years older than I was. And when I was a seventh grader, he was a freshman, and and he just I don't I didn't know he was there because I was I I was sports. I loved basketball. I loved play everything. I'd ignore the boys because I kind of one of them. <laughs> It'd be kind of rough and double, but then he kind of, I don't know just how it did happen. <laughs> Do you? No, it just did. <laughs> just did. And we never dated anybody else. We dated all the way through high school. And when uh, I graduated, he he was two years ahead of me, and he was out two years before I left. And in June the 18th, right during harvest, we decided we wanted to get married. And, Mom and Dad probably should have shot us for that, but they didn't. They gave us a beautiful wedding, and either your folks or my folks, Juan should have yeah. shot us. But <laughs> they get didn't. married right there in harvest. harvest. But the her folks had just finished harvesting, and they always had a custom harvester cut their wheat, and uh, so they stayed until after we got married. 
and then they went on back to Kansas. And then Dad, our, we hadn't even cut our wheat yet because we had one on sandy ground and, and the wheat was later over there than it was on the hard ground. So anyway, we got married and uh, our folks had just finished harvest and Dad hadn't started yet. So. It, you know, we just, uh, I, I don't ever, I mean, really, I don't know if I ever remember not knowing him. Because he, he was kind of ornery, because I remember Dad, when before we even started dating, he'd say, I know that Billy Stanley's the orneriest kid I ever saw. <laughs> there he was. He ended up being his son-in-law. <laughs> but he, but the folks dearly loved him, so, because we didn't have any brothers. Because I come from a family of four girls, I mean, four of us girls. And, and we didn't have a brother, and, and uh, when I got married, well, I, but but my four sisters, the oldest one had a boy, the second one had two boys, I had two boys and a girl. I was the only girl in the, and then my sister had twin boys. Hmm. In fact, her one of her twins is the manager at the OSU football equipment down at Oklahoma State. Hmm. So it's only one girl in that generation. Their yeah. yeah. dad always said that the Lord blessed him with four daughters and the devil paid him back or something. <laughs> <laughs> and where did you go to school? Jet. Both yeah. of us were jet night. Uh -huh. Yeah, when it was just Jet High School then and uh, the Nash joined Jet later. It was Jet Nash. Jet Nash. And then Helene and Gulter went together, and it was Helene and Gulter. And then they, Helene and Gulter and Jet Nash went together and made Timberlake. Timberlake. So now it's Timberlake School. Hmm. But, uh, and it's named after an old settlement halfway between Nash, or between Jet and Helene. Helene. It was called the Timberlake Community, named after a rancher that on some land down there around that area. How about the elementary school? It's, it's up, up here, here. Up at Jet in the junior high and high schools at Helena. When you went? Oh, when I went, it was all up there at Jet. There was a four, a three-story school when we used to, the school and then and they built a new grade school in, what year was that? It'd be Three, 54. Yeah. I worked on it and this after yeah. I graduated. Yeah. So anyway, they built on the grades. And then they tore the high school down and built a high school and just put it together. And that's what it, and then now it's a, it's a pre-K to the sixth grade. So. Yeah. School buses then? Uh-huh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let's see. Yeah, when, I was in the first grade, we had eight buses, and one of them had to make two routes. First bus in had to go out to the corner where we caught the bus, and there was 17 of us got on the bus there, three families. We all had to walk down to the corner, and the bus would come out there and pick us up, turn around and go back two miles. It didn't matter which bus got in first, but they had to come out and get us. You have to be last to get into school then. Yeah, and we started walking to school because sometimes in the winter time the buses was late and they wouldn't get there till ten or eleven o'clock, and so we just walked to school. Well, then we found out, the folks found out, we were counted tardy because we walked to school. But if we waited and rode the bus, even if we didn't get there till noon, we were not counted tardy or absent. That's something. That's but something if you enough. but if you walked and was late, then you were tardy. Mm -hmm. So they were pretty strict with the way things were done then. So. More so than they are now. And probably our group was one of the most fortunate in the fact that after World War II, a lot of the veterans came home and went back to school and then became teachers and coaches and and they still remember the discipline that they had when they was in the service, and they used it at school. 
they were tough. Oh God, we were scared to death of them. <laughs> yeah, they were all nice people. And yeah, good but teachers. boy, I mean, but boy, you didn't do anything to uh, uh, upset them because they they didn't bother them to spank kids, uh, uh, and they didn't care who who didn't like it because <laughs> they they still had the discipline that they was in service with. And did you experience any of the discipline? Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Since never, you were ornery? <laughs> I never did get a spanking, but I got close a couple of times. And then one time we were in the state playoffs and we only in 11 man football before they had eight man. And they, we only had 16 in high, boys in high school that could play football. We had two or three others that weren't able physically to play. So they were the, well, the what do you call them? The trainer. I mean, trainers, trainers or, or whatever. Uh, water boys or whatever. Property and stuff. Mm -hmm. But they were there every day and get, kept everything gathered up for us. So we were going to be in the state playoffs, and one of the teams we was going to play was playing in Pond Creek, so we asked the coach if we could go over and watch that game, because we was going to play the winner of that game. And he said, no, I don't want you over there messing around. I won't want any of you over there. So one of the guys that was in our class went to Korea. He, he joined the National Guard before they went to Korea. Well, when he came home under the, what was the GI Bill, he could get paid to go to school. So he went to high school and graduated with our class. Mm. Well, he had a car. <laughs> so about five of us went to Pun Creek to watch the ball game. And we said, I can remember sitting over there and we'd kind of turn around and look, is there any, <laughs> any smoke back to the west? Or, Anyway, we thought, well, everything's all right. We got back into town that evening or afternoon and saw the superintendent walking down the street. And we waved at him. He waved back at us and went, oh, yeah, we're all right. Until the next morning. And then, well, that night when I got home, Dad was on the school board. And he said, <laughs> the hell was you today? Oh, we went to Pond Creek for the ball game. How did you know? Well, they called out here and wanted to know where you were, if you're sick. And Mom told them I wasn't sick. And then I had to be over there at the ball game. Anyway, when we got to school the next morning, the superintendent, we had to go meet with him. And he said, well, you boys skipped school, so I want you to go up and see Mr. Rankey, he was our coach. And whatever punishment he deals out, I'll stand behind him. Hell, we'll go up and see Mr. Rankey. <laughs> and we got up there and he had on a whole polo shirt and his face <laughs> and neck was red, <laughs> clear down as far as you could see in that shirt. And he let into us and chewed us up one side and down the other and then told us if we didn't give 110% that week in practice that they, he would cancel the ball game. So. But we didn't, we didn't get a spanking, so. But did and you we win the game? game? We won the game. <laughs> and we practiced hard all week. <laughs> but we didn't have enough players to have another team to scrimmage against, so we'd have to play this side of the line against this side of the line and scrimmage all our plays going that way, and then we'd turn it around and do all of them going this way. And that's the way we practiced. So. And you played during the day, then? The game yeah. played during the yeah. day? Before night, before night lights. Yeah. Yeah. When yeah. when I started school, there wasn't any lights on the football field, and the year I was about the eighth grader, I guess, they made a deal with Cherokee. They had lights, and so all of our home games were played at Cherokee mm -hmm. at night because they thought they'd get a bigger crowd. And you graduated high school when? Fifty-three. Fifty-three, and then you would have been fifty-five. Mm -hmm. And you got married in 55. Yeah, I got married in 55, June of 55, yeah. And then we were married, uh, let's see, we got married and then um, we went to California two years, no, about a year and a half, wasn't it? Yeah. 
because we put what little bit of land we had, we put in the soil bank, and uh, we went out there. And was out well, there. we hadn't raised a crop in three years. Three years. So we went out there, and he got on working out there right after we moved out there. His brother was out there and wife. And uh, we was out there 18 months, and we had Guy of our oldest boy. We had him before we left. And then I had our little girl with Sean, Prune Picker, and uh, she was just like six months old, or six weeks old when we came back, because his brother was coming back, so we just moved back. But that, ain't, that wasn't to raise a family out there. Oh, that was awful. You couldn't leave the kids out in the yard uh -huh. to play because somebody would get them. It was just really bad. Well, we and, uh, decided we'd just be poor and move back here where back. we can raise well, a family. What were you doing in California? Well, when I went out, uh, my brother worked at Douglas Aircraft, and he thought he could get me on there. And so I had an uncle that lived out there, and he got a hold of me and told me that there was a service station that was needing help, and if I'd go down there and apply, I could probably get on. So I did, and we got there Friday night, mm -hmm. had $16 left in my <laughs> pocket, <laughs> and I had a flat on the way out there, and I didn't have a spare when we got there. And I went down the next morning, and I, no, I went down that afternoon when we got there, mm -hmm. and applied, and I went to work the next morning. Mm -hmm. And when I went down to apply, do you remember the old movie or story on television, Ben Casey, mm -hmm. the doctor? When I filled out my application, the lady said, uh, would you wait here just a minute? In a little bit, the door would open about like Ben Casey coming through the door into the operating mm -hmm. room. And it was the general manager of this uh, service station. He said, well, can you go to work? And I said, well, right now, I guess. And he said, you show up in the morning and tell me where to be. And so we'll put you to work. And because I was from the rural Midwest, they wanted all those people they could get because they'd work. And a lot of them they had wouldn't work. And, uh, so. He put me to work as soon as I got there. But he made and money, yeah. We had a, a system where if we did more business this month than we did last month, we got a commission. And with the pay and the commission, uh, I could make more money than my brother did out working for Douglas, and he'd worked 15 years. Mm -hmm. And he was the assistant lead man. And, the stretch press that made the nose cone on some of those fighter planes, uh, the others couldn't set it up to do that. And so he'd have to set up the machine for them to do their shift before he went home. And then he'd have to change it back to do what they were doing. So he had a good job, but I could still make more at the service station than he was making there. I think this guy that had the service station had seven stations, you know, through the Long Beach. They had, a, they had 11. 11? No. 12. They had 12, because they had six that were incorporated in one deal and six yeah. in another. Back in the days when it was full service? Yeah. Yes. Oh, um, yeah. Clean your windows and everything mm -hmm. out? Yeah, you Check ran your gave, we, the company gave away a Cadillac every two months as a gimmick. Come on. So when you went out to grade a customer, you gave them two tickets to the Cadillac drawing. And it didn't matter whether they bought anything or not, you still give them two tickets. And then you washed their windshield and you checked the air and the tire and you checked under the hood for the oil and the water and brake fluid, all that stuff. Washed all the windows clear around, not just the windshield. But it was full service. And this was in Long Beach? Yeah. yeah. And and you you ran out if you were working back in the shop or whatever you was doing, you had to wash your hands and you ran out to wait on the car and you ran back to make their change and then you ran back to give them their change. 
because cash register was inside. You had to go in to tally the deal up. <laughs> but it was, that was full service. Well, they don't have it now, do they? No. Uh -uh. I have had, after I worked there, of course, in Long Beach, it was close to the beach, and there was always a fine layer of sand on the sidewalk and on the pavement. And I'd wear out a pair of shoes every two weeks. Wear the soles on. And I had a pair of GI shoes, and I thought, well, these will last. Hmm. They didn't last any longer. That sand, when you're running and walking, it just. It's like sandpaper. Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. And then we had to mop the drives in the lube bay three times a day. And the restrooms had to be cleaned three times a day. All that stuff. And it, it, they were out to make, you know, do business. And the guy that owned all of them, Harold Parks, uh, he didn't have any kids, but he was a multi-millionaire. And he started out, he put in a service station and there was a gas line that ran underneath his service station and he dug it out and tapped into it and was selling somebody else's <laughs> gas. <laughs> that's the reason he had 12. <laughs> and that's where he made all his money. Mm -hmm. And then when he started hauling it from there over to another station he built, they had a greater loss on the line than they knew should be, so they started investigating <laughs> and they found out what he was doing. But by then he was started. And Didn't. He had his own trucks and went to the refinery and got the gas and brought it out and put it in the tanks. And <laughs> It was a pretty big operation for them at that time. Well, when your your brother decided to come back to Oklahoma and you came on back too, did you have any idea what you were going to do? We were going to farm. I was going to help Dad, but Dad had got bit by a spider and was having a terrible time with his knee, can hardly get around. Her dad had said that he was getting about ready to retire. Then the Social Security thing come along, and they couldn't retire until they had two or three more years into Social Security so they could draw, not the maximum, but they could draw more. So we just kind of, uh, her uncle got killed in a car wreck two miles where the old town of Jet was, and they didn't have anybody to farm that, so they rented that to us. And, and then the place that we put the saw bank came out and I farmed dead. So we had those two places to farm. And then after her dad did retire, well then we farmed more of the ground that he farmed. So that I guess we decided we yeah. gonna farm whether we could whether we could make or, it or not. Whether we made any money or not. But you know, we always the kids always was right on the farm, and I wouldn't have trade that for nothing. They just but you know it was different then than it is now. Uh, if one of our neighbors had a problem, needed help, that dad would say, "Why don't you boys go down and help Frank, or go up and help John?" And and we didn't expect any pay. Just did it. We just was neighbors, and we'd go help them, and. Uh, that, that was almost every year there was one of the neighbors somewhere that needed help and we'd go help them. And uh, when her dad had trouble with his back and couldn't do their chores, uh, dad said, you always go over and help them out with the chores and see if you can help out over there. But it's just one of those deals that everybody was neighborly and tried to help. Well, do you know your neighbors today? Just got one. Just got one up on the hill. <laughs> yeah, that's weird. And how has that changed through the years? Were there, did there used well, to be a lot more? Bigger farmer, and people started coming in from other areas and renting ground. And uh, there used to be, if a place was going to sell or a renter was going to leave the farm and somebody, they needed somebody else to farm it. It was kind of, well, so-and-so ought to have that. They're right there next to us. They've always been good neighbors. But now it, 
He didn't throw it away. It's just whoever's got the most money is going to get it. And the people that live there aren't don't live around here anymore. People that own the land. Uh, I was talking to an attorney, I don't know, four or five years ago, and he said in Cherokee there was over three million dollars went out of Cherokee that day, out of the banks. There were two estates that had been settled, and the kids lived on the east coast and the west coast. They sold the land and took the money out of the bank, and, and that's what's happened to all the small communities. It, the, the money that was available in the area to, to be loaned down for farming has all went to the east coast and the west coast because that's where the heirs are. And then one of the ladies over at uh, uh, FSA, now used to be the ASCS office, she said they have people call and say, what do I need to know about this farm program? And they try to tell them, that I don't want to mess with it. I think I'll just sell it. <laughs> now, or do you know somebody that might want to rent it? And they, they don't want anything, they don't, don't want to be involved it. in it. They don't particularly, some of them don't particularly want to sell it, but they will because they just don't want to be involved in it. How do you keep up with farm programs today? Oh, she, if something's on the internet, she'll tell me and I'll go read it. But yeah, they send you. I don't spend much time on the internet. <laughs> well, they, se they send it on the it. internet. They, se they send it out now on the internet. Yeah, so. all the farm offices <laughs> are. are on the internet. And you can go in and pull it up and see what their last uh, program, was, program was or the last uh, newsletter they sent out. So they post the newsletters on the internet, and then I take the Hot Plains Journal and several other farm magazines. Oh, when I when I was in high school, I used to go to uh, Tulsa to the fair and stock show. Of course, you know when you're in high school, you're pretty important. <laughs> well, Red-headed newspaper boy come along and he said, paper mister? And I said, no, I can't read. And he said, well, put one under your arm, you won't look so damn dumb. <laughs> <laughs> he had an answer for everything. <laughs> so anyway, uh, while I was over at the fair, they always had a cane, the Tulsa State Fair, marked on the cane. And if you subscribed in a new subscription to a farm magazine, they'd give you one of those canes. Well, I think I had about a hundred years of subscription <laughs> by the time I got out of high school for the Progressive Farmer or Farm and Ranch, one of those. And finally they started sending us another magazine so they could use up that prepaid prescription that, or subscription that I, was two dollars. I get a cane. So. How many canes? Did you? Yeah, he had a lot. <laughs> I still got two or three of them canes yeah. around here somewhere. Hope you don't need them. <laughs> yeah, I do too. Yeah, I give a lot of them away. So, do you keep up with the the weather through the mezzanine or some other source, or yeah. usually on television? television. Yeah. Uh, all of them's got it on their phone, and they can pull it up, but. It's usually changed by the time they pull it up. So. And it's hard to predict weather in this area because of the Rocky Mountains. The storms come over the mountains and then they go up or down or whatever. They don't know where they're going to go. So Social Security coming in in the 60s was a pretty big deal for, farm yeah, for yeah, farmers? Yeah. Yeah. You haven't had too many people talk about that aspect. Do you see anything else you want to remember from that? I remember that a lot of the, the first ones that started drawing their Social Security only paid the maximum in one year, and they do the maximum at that time. Of course, the maximum is higher than that now. But, uh, Dad's Social Security was pretty good because he had worked for the state on the highway department for four years, and then when they built the air base up here, he worked up there, and so he had 
made a contribution into the Social Security system, and uh, so his Social Security was was pretty good when he started growing. Now her dad was like we were; they didn't pay into it much, and and it was a thing that a lot of the farmers well, pay into Social Security. It won't be there when I get ready for it. So it's a government program. It's not going to work. You know, kind of deal. Yeah. And so they didn't pay in if they didn't have to. And uh, then when it come time to draw it, they didn't draw much either. I guess it was the Medicare that came along with it that they yeah. benefited the most. Yeah, yeah. right. Yeah. And then her granddad on the other side, her dad's dad, they didn't know he existed. <laughs> He never paid income tax. Oh. <laughs> he never signed up for nothing. Anything. But he was chairman of the Democratic County Democrats. Uh -huh. And he was chairman of the election board. And he was on the Federal Land, Land Bank, Bank board. board. He did all that. And, and never had tenants. had a social security number, never had, never paid taxes. I don't know. He didn't know he existed, I guess, yeah. but he was on all those other things. Never made a great deal of money either, then, I guess. No, no probably not, no. Yeah. Uh -uh. Yeah. They had a big family, yeah. and he was a horse trader. And he just, they did, did a lot of different things. things they, but he, he was one of his kind. I think he, had some money of his own by the time he retired because they always had a car and then they moved to town. And I have to tell him, I mean, tell you about Grandpa. He he did he drank a lot. <laughs> He'd go into town and come back take it. He'd set up the pool hall all day and drink beer. <laughs> and I don't care how big a man or how tough you are. After a while, it affects you. He didn't think so, but he did. So he left there one time and went home. At night. And, oh yeah, sometimes he'd stay all day and get in a pitch game up to the pool hall and wouldn't want to leave and might have won a hand or two, so he wanted to stay until he spent that. But anyway, when he went home, they lived four miles out of town, mm -hmm. four or five. Anyway, he, his son rented a place right north of town and when he left, he got over in the ditch and up in the fence, <laughs> tore out the fence between two telephone poles and then missed the telephone pole, went back and tore out some more fence. And so his son went out the next morning and he stopped at the house and he said, Dad, was that you that went through my fence? My cattle was out. No, lad, that wasn't me. <laughs> he said, well, I know it was because he said the wire's still out to the driveway where you drove in. And he said he had a granary there and he had a ladder and he always drove a straddle of the ladder. Well, when he did, all that wire under his car hooked the ladder and shoved it right out through the <laughs> north side of the granary. <laughs> but he said, now that was over on Vicker's side of the road that I get that fence. It wasn't yours. But he had all the fence under his car. <laughs> Made it home. <laughs> and when he got out of the car, he tripped on the water Wire. and fell down. down. Yeah. But it wasn't, he didn't do But it. He, didn't, he didn't get into the fence on that side. But that's on my dad's side, so. But that, I don't know. Uh, he would take Grandma to town with him a lot of days. And he'd go to the pool hall. And she'd buy her groceries and they'd box it up for her and then they're supposed to pick it up before they went home. And she'd go down and sit in the car the rest of the day. All day. All day long. People come, I'd stop and talk to her and visit with her. But he'd leave her, sat there in that car. Mm -hmm. He just, it was a different world, just, I guess. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's the way he grew up and I guess that's what he thought he was supposed to do. So. Mm -hmm. Well, today, how many acres are you farming? A 1,500. Okay. And for each of you, could you just take me through a, a typical day on the farm? Well, we get up and eat breakfast. 
and then we just go from there. Yeah, well, Whatever yeah. needs to be done. Yeah. That's usually if I have to go if I'm in the field, I'll go to the field and work ground and and uh but a lot of the younger ones anymore they don't have any regular routine as far as eating breakfast, eating we always call it dinner and supper, but now it's lunch and dinner. But uh, we still eat three meals a day, and, and on our time of when morning and noon and supper is. Now, the kids, they also, well, they want to wait till two o'clock to eat lunch, or they don't want to eat at all. But. It was always important to her family, and it was important to my family, that we be at the table when the meal's ready. And Dad made sure. He said, now if your mother's going to get up and fix breakfast, you're going to be in there to eat it. And if your mother's going to fix dinner, you're going to be there to eat it. She goes to all that work, and you don't feel like eating or you don't want to do this or you don't want to, you're going to be there. And if you don't eat, you're going to sit there. And, and her folks were the same way. Now, I think it's important to sit at the table as a family. And when, when you, then you can visit and uh, like our daughter, when her kids all come home, there's a basket there by the door and their cell phones go in that basket. She said, no, we're going to visit, we're going to be here as a family. Pick that phone up when you leave. Instead of all of them sitting around the table. <laughs> but I always feel like we try to be on a, not a, a real strict schedule, but some form that he knows where I'm at and I know where he's at. And uh, But we always, uh, I, we used to get up about oh, 6 in the morning and, and uh, he, it's just pretty much a day like that. How late do you? Do you stay working in the field? Oh, I used to work till 10 or 11 o'clock at night, but I'll be in by 6.30 or 7 now. Mm -hmm. And it, the older you get, and I'm getting there, uh, sitting in the tractor all day without getting out and walking around is bad for your circulation. Mm -hmm. And I had trouble with my feet swelling and I had to start wearing compression socks to so I've kind of learned to stop once in a while and get out and walk around. And, but I used to sit in the tractor 14, 16 hours a day and stop for lunch. Same way with the combine. And, uh, but I don't do that anymore. And I, and I shouldn't have done it back then. I think my circulation probably would have been better. I always, and I always try to do the mowing because he, you know, so because he, he really don't have time. And uh, yesterday morning I got on the mower about you know, nine. I didn't get off of it till four o'clock. <laughs> but it just seemed like uh, the yard gets bigger. <laughs> and that was the hottest day of the year. Yeah, mm -hmm. and it just. Uh, but I, I always like to have my grass mowed, and I do that. And I, I did. Were oh, we've got. I mean, there's such a few moments of our life anymore. We can't work like we used to, but I want to, we've got a, some buildings we want to take down, and I want to take my patio out because it's in bad shape. And, but we just work a little bit of time on that because uh, I can't do it all when I want to. So anyway, we just kind of plug along. <laughs> What do you see happening for the next 100 years for the farm? What do you hope? Oh, I hope that my generations keeps it a going. <laughs> Something has to change uh, from where, where we're headed now. Everything is big business now. Big business controls uh -huh. everything. And uh, something's got to happen or we're going to run out of food. It, it was all the hundreds of thousands of hands that built all this country. But you can't let it get in control of one or two big companies and, and Those survive. Those food will just keep it going up. We're, we're, I would say we're becoming more like the Romans. 
we want more time off for leisure than we spend working. And that was what ended their dynasty, so they became. But you know, I, I think a lot, lot of it, and it may not have a thing, but these mini marts, the people can't survive unless they go up to mini martins and get happy hour or just sit and listen to gossip and all that. To me, that is. But you, uh, it's just not you buy a car now according to how many cup holders there is, <laughs> instead of what the mileage is or <laughs> how comfortable it is. But I just our phone chargers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Place to plug in your phone to, charger. But to me, I mean, you know, we're 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 just not people to go to town and go to the co-op and sit and see what's the gossip. And used to be a farmer here that everybody said he'd grab the you know, paper first thing and see it was in the obituary column. So if anybody he knew, he'd go ask him for to rent his land, the rent. I mean, that was just a what he did. Well, it was just kind of standard joke yeah, in the community. Uh -huh. And he did. He ran a lot of land. But after uh -huh. some of the ones that started coming in from other areas uh, and more people moved off of the farm, they, it, it began to change. It mm -hmm. wasn't the yeah. same yeah. community it used to be. Well, mm -hmm. in a little town of Jet, my gosh, I bet there's 90% of the people, I don't even know who they are anymore, that's moved in. Mm -hmm. and, and they don't have, I mean, it, the, the town don't mean anything to those kind of people. It's the people that that's had their roots here for years, you know, that really, that means something to him. It's just like that house uptown that I had the shop. Uh, that was Aunt Bear and Uncle Ray's. And us girls, we used to spend at Shield. They always had water in town. We didn't have water where we lived. We, Dad and Mom had a hall water. And we, they'd buy us bathing suits. And we'd go in there, you know, and run and play in the sprinkler. And, and things like that I can remember. And uh, uh, they were important to people. But now it... I don't know. It doesn't mean nothing. Yeah. We tried to, Bill and I, uh, with the old bank building up there, and it's still standing. We we done everything in our power. We went and had guys come in from uh, Fort, uh, Fort, Easter, Scott. Fort Scott to estimate how much it would take to redo it, and and we was going to get grants to help pay for it, and uh, we just done a lot of legwork. But do you know every time they say, I don't know why you want to say that for, it's not worth it. Why they don't just tear it down? Just tear it down. You know, things like that, that we we tried to, you know, to do things for the town of Jed and uh, don't mean anything. Well, not to the ones now. Now, no, uh-uh. And, and then drugs. Oh, and yeah. Drugs was terrible. In this small town? Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh-huh. We've got one guy that's been in drugs ever since he's in high school. And he's already killed somebody, burned the building burnt. He's burnt two other buildings. He's burnt three buildings and had one guy work for him die, die. in a fire. And they have not done With one thing to him. And, uh, it's he always said, oh, I don't have to worry about the sheriff. He said, I give him enough money, he ain't going to bother me. They got a new sheriff now. We're going to see if that makes a difference. <laughs> well, do you envision yourself staying here till the very end? Oh, or, yeah. And have you got a, this, this things in place for you? you who gets it next? No, we we've talked. We, we have, have a trust. trust. That has a... Irrevocable trust. Automatic... What? Hand down to the next generation. Next generation. Now, personal things, uh, I've got to, I've got to do mark things and do that. I have. It's hard to do. It's very hard. It is very hard to I, do. I told her. I said, well, the best way to do that is just give it to them while you're still living. Then you know they got it. And but, they're not going to fight over. It. But none of them now have a place to put it. I mean, you know, our oldest son, his wife, don't care too. He's gonna holler about any of his things, and so she can throw out more she than... She don't care a whole lot about her family uh -uh, stuff. No. And, you know, Gib, I want him to have a, you know, he has his Grandpa Nelson's the old railroad watch, 
and his mother gave it to him when he was 50 years old. So we thought, well, Gibbs named after him, so, you know, Billy said, I'd like to give it to him. Well, we knew if we did, she, it would mean nothing to her. She'd either sell it or throw it away. Throw it away. So, you and know, you, her. And so you've got that problem. And we've got a daughter that doesn't throw away nothing. She, <laughs> she just wants everything. And, and then we, our son is that, I mean, he, he likes history and he likes family heirlooms. So, but they, this Hoosier cabinet we got uh, was my uh, grandma Je Hopkins. It came in a covered wagon from Missouri. And mom and dad gave it to me and we had it redone. Well, there's two that wants it. And so, you know, it's hard. And if I give it to him, but I, I could leave the old world where I didn't have to hear him fight, <laughs> that'd be fine with me. But a lot of the stuff we've got was family say, would you haul that off for us? Oh yeah, I'll haul it off. I'm going to haul it to my place. I don't care what you do with it. Take it down to the creek, do whatever you want to. With it. So we, just get it out of here. Yeah, so we've, you know, got so we just like take that. It, that one table that's in there was up when they sold her granddad's place, Della, grandpa, and uh, they said, would you haul that table out and take it down to the creek? And I said, well, I'll, I'll take it home. I'm not going to haul it to the creek. I don't care what you do with it. Just get it out of here. So we brought it home and I turned it. We had a, her other grandpa's wagon out there in the barn. So I just turned it upside down on that wagon and put it out there for seven or eight years, oh, yeah. probably. And one day she said, would you get that table down for me? I think I'm going to refinish it. And I said, yeah, where do you want it? She said, well, just put it in the driveway of the granary and I'll just work on it out there. So I did. And uh, then I, before she refinished it, I, her uncle had a, did carpenter work, had a router, so I borrowed his router and I run around the edge of it. So, smooth it all up so it can have splinters in it. And she refinished it and went, she got it all refinished and we brought it in the house. Everybody comes said, that looks like grandpa and grandma's table. Where'd you get it? Well, we was up to the sale and they wanted to get rid of it so we brought it back. Well, wish I'd have known that. Well, <laughs> they didn't see it like it was, it was. before yeah. she refinished it. So the solution in those days was to take it to the creek? Yeah. yeah. If you didn't want yeah. something, you took it to the to creek. Yeah, those platters and stuff. Hey, yeah. her, this uncle that was a carpenter, uh, he married uh, a German family's daughter, and they lived over on the creek. And they told him, said, get rid of all them old platters and stuff. Said they, there's ones that we brought from Germany. Said they're not, any, nobody wants them. Just, all down to the creek and dump them. So he did, and then he come by and he had the silverware. And he said, you kids want this silverware? Said, yeah, I want it. So he took it and he said, well, I'd have hauled a bunch of other stuff down to the creek. He said, I don't know whether it all got broke or not. So the next day he come by and he had three or four of them platters Lighters. and some dishes. And he said, well, these didn't get broke, so I dug them out of the creek where I threw that other stuff. Yeah, that's where everything went. And I went. told him, I said, well, where'd you throw it? I'll go over there and dig that stuff out and see if there's anything else. And he never would tell me where he threw it. So <laughs> he didn't want me over there digging around. I guess he'd hauled other stuff out there. That yeah. He didn't want me digging. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the place her sister got, her uncle lived there before that, and they had a trash dump on it. And we was over there one time digging around in that trash dump. Sandra all went down through there and found a whole bunch of full, like homebrew bottles that had the cork deal in them and the wire bale and you pull the wire bale down to seal the cork and we found a bunch of them and stuff that they'd thrown away years and years ago. It wasn't important to them. I no, mean, you they know, they wanted to get rid of it. They yeah. wanted something new and so they, and it's scattered all over the country. I found this uh, deal here about a year and a half, two years ago. <laughs> Out in the field. Out in the field. Where a house used to be. Yeah. But it's still in pretty good shape for 
however, however long it's been there. They used to vulcanize tires and that was a solution that they used to glue the tires together. But how it escaped it machinery, off. yeah. yeah. Cool. And you know, a lot of people used to find those dumps and take and shoot, you know, targets and see if they could hit them. And, and there, a lot of the stuff got broke that way. So. Yeah, I had a brother that was master at that, mm -hmm. throwing stuff in the air and shooting it. We had a football pad got us for Christmas one year. Neighbor kids was there and they'd been hunting. And one of them said, throw that ball up in the air, I'll see if I can hit it. And they said, well, you're not going to do that. And he said, throw it up there, I'll show you. Well, he threw the football up in the air, and he shot a hole right there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, goodness. Or holidays fun back in yeah. in, in this room years ago. <laughs> it was. Yeah, we used to have a lot of, lot of fun. Uh, well, we used to play cards. Yeah, and, and Billy's sister and brother and then his brother used to come they'd all come over we might play cards all night <laughs> two or three o'clock in the morning. morning and then we'd get up four thirty five o'clock go, go milk down, go milk cows and do chores but they didn't have anything to do they used to we or we milked when we come out in california we uh i don't know how many milk cows we started so we could have you know cream to sell and have that and uh, start out with ten. ten. Well, anyway, the kids Billy fixed the barn down there, so we could have. But we carried all that milk up here and <laughs> suffering. <laughs> anyway, but to make the story short, uh, we take the kids down. You know, we couldn't leave them in the house because we melt by hand. And our daughter, I mean, if she wasn't a pistol, she didn't like any part of this because we set them up on the kind of the oh feed barrel, feed barrel. You know, so they and. Uh, we, you know, take a while to milk by hand, and I that was a story of itself. Just to, you know, keep the kids satisfied, you know. So we, but anyway, when she got a little older, we decided well we might just leave her up the house. It would, and I'd just come up every little bit and check on her. My lord, she had every pot and pan in this house out of the cabinet. She, <laughs> it just right. Let me tell. I didn't do that no more. <laughs> But anyway, we used to milk, and that helped, you know, supplement buying our groceries, and and then we'd have our cows as a asset, and uh, we'd done that for. And then we got milkers. My dad had le uh, milkers, electric milkers, and we got them, and used to have the milkers that we could milk instead of by hand. We used the milkers. But anyway, we <clears throat> when we separate, we had. Uh, would buy did he go buy little pigs at the sale, <coughs> and then we feed them the whole milk after we separate because that you know you had to get rid of it some way. Anyway, went out there one evening and they were gone, them pigs were gone, and we looked and looked and looked <laughs> for them pigs, and finally about uh, how many months went by? Three or four months. Three months went, by, and we. They came across the pasture and was in the pen when we separated that night. And they had been over on our neighbor's north down in the in his Milo. Yeah. And when he cut the Milo, he said, I can tell you where your pigs, your pigs were at. at. <laughs> but they and they were he big. They had nest yeah, they were big enough for market, market when they came back. When they come back. <laughs> but, but he said they had Dug out, rooted out, yeah, uh -huh. nests over there in that, that Milo. But that's for and we. And it was by the creek. They had water. Well, they water. Just stayed over there. And in the meantime, he went back and got bought some more little pigs so we could have it for the milk. Well, yes. but that that's, uh, that's an experience. But but it did. I mean, we did do that. And then we had a huge garden, and I'd uh, take the uh, the guy that we did our grocery trading, he'd buy onions, potatoes, uh, tomatoes. Then I had people come to the house and, and bought out of the garden. And uh, so... Did you do chickens? Uh-huh. Chickens too. Oh yeah, we 
raised chickens, dressed chickens. But, you know, I'd have uh, probably in the springs when we usually dress our chicken, I'd have over 100, 25, 50 in the freezer. And, and that fed the family. You know, that's about all the meat we, we had. We had chicken till the next spring when mm -hmm. we get the next bunch. When we come from California, though, we, he, uh, we didn't have, I mean, didn't have nothing. We were out of debt then. That's about all I could say. But he'd kill some rabbits, and, and we, I'd fix rabbit for, you know, meal. I didn't care for him, but it was better than nothing. So, and. Did you have a method for killing your chickens? Yeah, how we did it, yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, we'd step on their neck and pull their neck on them and let them flop. And then we'd... Uh, scald them. Scald them and pick the feathers and singe them. And, uh, and then cut them up. Cut them up. Mm -hmm. But you can't do that anymore, do you? Uh -uh. You can't. Would you, would you do a, a what we call the pulley bone part? Uh-huh. Uh -huh. yeah. The bush bone? Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. You can't find those anymore. No, no they're already no, cut they, two. They, uh -huh. they don't cut them that way anymore. Uh -huh. Yeah, they don't. A, it's a different, you know, we used to, I used to cut them up and then it got where one time I did them by myself. His mother always was real good to come over and I'd help her with her chickens and then we'd come over and she'd help me. But once in a while maybe something should happen that she didn't get to come. I'd, I'd dress a hundred a day. A lot of work yeah, too. it was a lot of work. But that's... Then we sell some to help pay the cost, cost of yeah. raising the ones we kept. Yeah. And then, uh, we'd sell them for a dollar a piece dressed. Then there was a place up at Waukita that this lady had a, that she dressed, I mean, she you take them up there and then she would dress them, but she had a, a picker, you know, that she would, of course, when she killed them, she'd stick them down in funnels until they quit kicking. But anyway, she had a, and then dipped them in a scalding bat, but she had a picker that, had little rubber pickers on it, it. Turned. and it and turned real fast, and she could, off. you know, put and get the feathers off. Mm. And we used to do that, and, and of course, it back then it didn't really cost it was like ten cents a chicken or fifteen, and it got where we did take them up there and let her do them. So it's ten cents, yeah, for her to do it. But even then. That didn't last long, and then they got where I suppose they couldn't get rid of the feathers, or maybe oh, the, probably some health. regulations. Right? Kept yeah, from doing it. To, yeah, yeah, I kept her yeah. from doing it. So regulations changed the dairy business too. Yeah, oh, yeah. a lot. Yeah. That was terrible. Yeah, we had some neighbors that was in a uh, dairy business that sold the milk instead of the cream, and they was always have to either put in more windows or take windows out and close them up and change the way the barn was and it just constantly they was having to change their barn to fit the new regulation. Mm -hmm. And they do it but it finally got them. Yeah, took care of them. Well, we've covered quite a bit of ground today. Is there anything else you want to add before we close out? Well, we have uh, the original patent and land grant that her grandpa got. Okay. We can look at those when we shut off. Well, if there isn't, thank you very much for sharing. It's been a pleasure. Well, we could just... Well, seem like I haven't done much, but... <laughs> no. Maybe... It's covered enough territory that we've covered quite a bit so thank you very much you will